Hey guys and welcome to Kazcast episode 20. Today on the podcast we welcome Tony Jeffries. Tony is a ex-Olympian and bronze medal winner at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. As well as this, Tony is a undefeated professional boxer. Unfortunately in 2011 due to injuries Tony had to retire. Since then he has transformed his life and has made the move from Sunderland to Los Angeles. You could say Tony is now living the American dream with two successful gyms and the owner of the Box and Burn Academy. Tony shares some great advice for young athletes who have suffered with injuries such as Tony did and how through hard work and motivation and a positive attitude you can turn your life around. Please like and share this podcast and please subscribe to my channel. It's time for the podcast so cue the music, enjoy. There are no constraints on the human mind. No walls around the human spirit. No barriers to our progress except those we ourselves erect. Make your life a story worth telling. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and welcome to Kazcast episode 20. Today on the podcast, we welcome ex-Olympian and professional boxer, Tony Jeffries. In 2008, Tony won a bronze medal at the Beijing Olympics before turning professional, where he remained undefeated. After Tony's boxing career, he made a move to LA, where he continues to work as a coach, educator, and podcaster, and has trained some of Hollywood's biggest stars. Tony is also the creator of the very successful Box and Burn Academy, which enables personal trainers and boxing enthusiasts to deliver highly effective boxing workouts. If you can't physically train with Tony in Santa Monica, you can check out his social media and online boxing tutorials where he helps sharpen your skills and helps you to get in the best shape of your life. You could say Tony is living the American dream. Would you say that that's accurate, Tony, living the American dream? <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely out here, mate. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, it's definitely out here. I'm living, I'm living the dream. It's mad, mate. It's mad. My life's changed so much since the Olympic Games. Yeah, it's I bet, mate. Here. I bet. So I just wanted to start start off uh, the podcast just asking you because I know you grew up in in Sunderland. So when you grew up, were you surrounded by a lot of boxing gyms growing up in Sunderland? Did you accidentally fall into the gym one day and start from there or did you always want to box did you know you wanted to box was it in your family uh, it was kind of in my family my uncle was a professional boxer and ever since i learned to walk my granddad his dad used to have me throw punches on his hands and try to get me in a boxing stance and uh he took me to the gym when i was 10 years old didn't really know what i was doing what i was getting into and uh yeah i went for a few for, well, for, for a few years yeah uh, had 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 my first fight lost. Had my second fight lost. Was thought I'm not very good at this. Had my third fight, then I start winning. Yeah. And then when I was uh, when I was 13, I won my first national title. I was the champion of the, of England at, at 13 years old, and then yeah, got picked the box for England, and then it just started a snowball from there. I yeah, yeah. I was pretty good at this. Yeah, cool. I mean, getting getting picked to to, to box for England at the time. I mean, that must have been. An incredible feeling in such a short amount of time to have got the opportunity to to have done that. I mean, and that must have gave you huge confidence once you got that um, that call up. Yeah, it was amazing boxing for England. I think I was I maybe fourteen. Yeah, uh, but I lost the fight. I boxed against Ireland and I lost the fight. So I thought, oh, it's the last time I want to be boxing for England. Yeah, uh, but it was amazing because when you, I know when you, when you play football, you get caps every time you play for uh, for England, and in boxing you get a vest. Yeah, so. Just to get that England vest was like such a big achievement. At I the bet. time, it was the best thing in the world, you know, having an England vest. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I continued to box for England, and I ended up boxing for England and Great Britain 56 times in, in yeah. my career, captain That's... in the England boxing team, so it was great. That's amazing. So was that always the goal? When you was an amateur boxer, Was it were the Olympics in sight, or did that just sort of come along surprisingly, or did, was your plan always amateur and then turn to professional? Olympics by the time I was 16 yeah. years old um, 
and I got put on an eight-year training program for the Olympics. So it was like, wow, the Olympics are there. But it wasn't just eight years, like straightforward eight years, because in the, in them eight years, you had a ton of different goals. Like like in four months, I'll be boxing in the multi nations in Bulgaria. Yeah. And after that, the European champions championships will be in in Sardinia, and then you know, so there was tons of little goals and loads, loads of little steps to get to get them eight years. So it was broken down. Uh, yeah. So I had, I had trained for eight weeks for like, let's say, the World Championships and then you go to the World Championships then you've got another time after that. And, yeah. You know, you've just got to get successful with that. Yeah, I suppose there's so many little goals to achieve before you get to the big one. So when you finally got through all that and you got a chance to go to Beijing, what was that whole experience like going to Beijing? That must have been that great time in your life going there. Yeah, it was amazing. Well, just to qualify because the pre- in the previous eight years there'd only been two guys went to the Olympics and one was Audley Harrison and one was Amir Khan. Yeah. Oh no, sorry, there's Courtney Fry as well. Courtney Fry went to the Olympics as well. Uh, with with Audley in 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 Australia, in Sydney in two thousand. So from two thousand to two thousand and eight there'd only been three Olympians boxers. So to to qualify for the Olympics we knew it was a huge, huge thing and a huge task. So to finally qualify I mean, it was the, the best feeling ever because you've been on this eight-year training program to go to the Olympics. Now I qualified, and I was like, "Yes, no." Yeah. Wasn't. And then to, to go to Beijing and then obviously have success there and come back with the medal, it was like the icing on the cake. It was like the best thing ever. Yeah, I bet. And boxing, I imagine it adds another layer. Like when you're boxing for yourself as an amateur, but then actually boxing for your country, that must have felt different. Like when you walked out, the atmosphere. Um, perhaps did you feel more pressure because of it? You, I mean, you must have when you're boxing for your country. Well, yeah, yeah. Not not so much because I was boxing for the country because I'd, I'd boxed for the country like like fifty odd times before that. Mm-hmm. But but boxing live on TV and, yeah. and knew that there was thousands of pe- people at home, yeah. or millions watching. You know, yeah. so it put the pressure on you. And being on an eight year training program to get there, then getting closer to winning the medal, there was yeah. a, a, you, could, you could feel the pressure. It was a crazy feeling. Yeah. So when you had a big fight coming up, um, how would you how would you sort of like to prepare um, physically and like mentally for that fight? So in terms of physically, like a training camp, like how would you structure your training camp between like skill, sparring, strength and conditioning, right, yeah. and how did you sort of how did you sort of prepare like mentally for a fight? Was there anything you would do to help yourself stay calm, focused, or what was your sort yeah, of style? Well, so physically, like the training program, we'd, we'd for the Olympics we'd be training three or four times a day would be very in- intense some of the sessions yeah. would last 20 minutes some sessions would last 90 minutes yeah. we're all, all very lots of technique stuff uh, sparring two or three times a week with other champions so I, my main sparring partner was James D. Gale who won gold yeah. uh, he was the weight below me so I had great sparring all the time yeah uh, yeah it was it was very physical lots and lots of training and then mentally um i would i would do visualization uh, mm-hmm. the night before the fight visualizing everything from walking to the ring to um to to, to getting my hands wrapped to, to, to warming up like i say walking to the ring then then the fight yeah. the bell going the first round the second round and then then winning the fight so i would do visualization because the benefit of that is like when you get to the venue, you've kind of already went over all of this in your head, so it keeps yeah. the ner- keeps you calm and keeps you less nervous. So that was massive. That was a that was a tip Audley Harrison gave me uh, before I went to the Olympics. I remember I was sitting in a restaurant and I'd always look up to Audley because he, he won the gold in two thousand, and uh, he was the one who made, got the funding in place to help us. So he'd always been a, someone yeah. who I'd really look up to. In a restaurant, got a phone call. Hey Tony, Audley Harrison. I was like. <laughs> oh really? No way. And he's like, yes. Yeah. And he, I was start talking to him, and yeah. it was a great conversation. He told me all about visualization, and mm-hmm. that really helped. I think that was part of my success as well. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't actually the fact that there was uh, was there a coach um, who worked with uh, the fighters through visualization, or was that something you did off your own back, like you wanted to add in yourself? Yeah, I added that in myself. We had yeah. we had uh, sci- uh, sports psychologists work with us, yeah. but uh, uh, but. No one ever told me that. Apart, like oddly told me that. So yeah. we had sports psychologists work with us for for different things. Like for for example, when you're walking around the venue of the fight and your opponent's there, make sure you're walking around with your head held high, your head held high. Yeah. Because that tells your opponent that you're confident. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where, before the bell rings in the first round, make sure you're at the centre of the ring. 
re- ready to go because that tells your opponent like you're ready for this in between each rounds. Little things like that, what make a, a big big difference in 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 your fight and you know like getting in your opponent's head with things like that, showing them that you're not bothered and you're not afraid or, or whatever. Yeah. So the sports psychologists help a lot with them, that sort of stuff. And they would analyse different countries like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and see what they did, mm-hmm. their fighters did before a fight and that was some of the things that we got from them. Awesome, mate. Sounds good. So you get your bronze medal, um, you come back from Beijing and is your plan to go straight uh, into professional uh, boxing after that when you get back and, and how long was it until you had your first uh, pro fight? After Beijing, yeah. So when when so before I went to Beijing, I was working on a catering trailer, uh, flipping burgers, not making yeah much money. But I was ma- I was making alright. I was doing alright, like five, like three, four hundred pound in a weekend, which is good for how much boxing. I was working on the doors as a nightclub doorman. Yeah. After that, which was making another few hundred pounds. So I was making like five hundred pound in the two days, then training all week. So I was doing alright. Uh, I was working my ass off, a little entrepreneur, yep. and and then. Uh, when I went when I went to the Olympics, I come back. I just knew that there was going to be so many promoters because we were talking about before offering us bags of money to turn professional. Mm-hmm. So it was the it was the next thing to do, and yeah, and it, and it was right. So I was getting offered lots of money to turn professional, but it wasn't the money that we expected. We were expecting to get 150 grand to sign non bonus. Yeah, and because it was 2008, the credit crunch just hit. People stopped going to boxing shows and stop buying tickets. You know, that 150 grand that I was expecting turned mm-hmm. into 40 grand. Yeah. So, and that's how much it went when I signed pro. That's a 40,000 pound sign on bonus. But that being said, that was a lot of money at the time. Yeah. You know, it was a lot of money at the time. And then getting offered, I, I was getting 12,000 pound to fight uh, outside of Sunderland. When I fought in Sunderland, I get 20,000 pound. Again, a lot of money come. From, from where I come from working on a night from Dorman to getting these big stacks of money to fight these guys who to be honest weren't in my league mm-hmm. I've been fighting for England and Great Britain for for uh, for years fighting champions different country then I come and fight journeyman who's yeah. had who's had 15 fights and won 3 or 4 you know I'll, I'll battle them so I was getting paid shit ton of money for boxing guys who shouldn't have really been in the ring with us. Yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> it was yeah, amazing. it sounds it. Yeah, easy money for you. Because I suppose your skill yeah. level is just so much higher because you've just, you've been through the Olympic program and you've honed all your skills. And yeah, I suppose you was almost going through the motions in some of those those fights. So looking back at your professional career, do you have like a like a standout moment? Because I know you said you fought, did you fight a, a couple of fights in, um, in, in Sunderland in front of like your home crowd? Yeah, my, my standout yeah. moment. And my and and the second best I've just posted about this on social media. And the second best moment of my life was when I fought in Sunderland in my second professional fight. Yeah. The t- the tickets went on sale, uh, and fifteen minutes later, the, the two thousand tickets sold out mm-hmm. uh, within fifteen minutes. And everyone was there to support me. They were chanting my name, and like I said, a, a guy who worked on a catering trailer. Now now I've got the whole city behind us. Yeah, live yeah. on Sky Sports. Yeah. Walking up the ring. It was the, the, the second best moment of my life. First, obviously, being guaranteeing that Olympic medal. Yeah. Uh, it was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, I bet it was. Because, like, people could relate to you. You must have just been such a well known figure, like, within the community and in Sunderland. And, yeah, that must have been a, an awesome yeah, moment was, when you walked so out. Good. Cool, mate. So good. Awesome. So, unfortunately, was it 2011? Um, was it when you, when you retired? In 2011, yeah. yeah. So hand injuries. Um, was was this something that was ongoing throughout your career, or was there like a particular fight where your your hand got badly injured and it never recovered? Um, and how did that happen for you? It was it's through my career. So yeah, when I was when I was young, when I was like 12, 13, I used to punch really hard for my age, but my hands weren't developed to take the power. Mm. I didn't know about wrapping my hands. That I makes used to sense. Yeah. Gloves. Mm-hmm. And uh, I injured my hands then, and they were they were always bad, and, right. and they never really got better. Yeah, since, since I was since I was a kid, uh, but it got to the point where I was professional, and just all them years of wear and tear on your hands. Yeah, it got to the point where I couldn't uh, zip my trousers or button a t-shirt, so I had to get surgery. Got surgery. The surgery. Yeah, didn't go to plan, and I got forced to retire. 
at yeah. a time it was horrible I got fat got depressed started drinking and it was the worst moment of my life because I'd boxed since I was 10 years old all the way till now I'm 27 mm-hmm. and it's like shit now what am I going to do yeah and that's sort of now, a tough age anyway yeah 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 but now looking back at it it was the best thing that could have happened to us because my life now is yeah. way better than it's ever been before yeah and exactly and that's kind of what I was I was going to ask you next because it, like you say, it, at the time, it must have been so, so tough. And at 27 years old, and it's sort of a, you know, a, a tough age anybody, anyway for, you know, for young men that sort of, you know, 20 to 35, trying to figure out sort of what you want to do with your life. And at 27, that's right in the middle there. So, and for a lot of athletes, they don't retire until later, you know, 30 or 35. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine that was a tough, tough one, especially the fact that you was undefeated. So you knew you had the skill but it's just your hands were just yeah. letting you down, so that must have been tough. So, um, how? So, if you were to maybe offer a bit of advice to say some athletes who, you know, they through their um, sport and they've had to retire early, what sort of advice do you feel like you could offer um, if that does happen to someone? How they can sort of push through it and push forward and sort of reinvent themselves like you have? Is there any advice you could give to a fellow yeah. like athlete who that's happened to? Yeah, and, and this is easier. Well, I'm about to say it's easier said than done. Yeah. But it's if you're an athlete, obviously you're disciplined, you're dedicated, you're a hard worker. Now, if you can at your craft, whether it's whether it's boxing or, or football or whatever it may be, if you can transfer that energy and that hard work and and dedication to something else that you love, that you could make a, a business out of, do that. Yeah. Because. Obviously, I was super dedicated and super hard working to, to, to get the Olympics. Now I've put that energy into business, and now I'm doing now I'm doing really well, you know. Yeah, so definitely that makes sense. I mean, if you're a high level athlete and you it shows you've got focus, determination, your discipline, you can just like you say turn and put that energy into something new, like a new business. Um, so yeah, so going on to that really, so. Moving to LA, how did that come about? Because moving to Sunderland from LA, that's a hell of a move. Was that a spare of the moment or had you been planning it? How how'd that come about for you, moving to, to LA? And, and what did you do when you first got there? Uh, so I, I was actually training at LA. I used to train at LA and fight back in the UK. I was trained with Tommy Brooks. Yep. Uh, I was in the same, the same uh, training camp as Evander Holyfield. Yeah. And... Um, uh, uh, and I fell in love with Elliot. And my wife did as well, so we decided to to, to move out here. So we, uh, yeah, we, we moved out here and, and we loved it, and uh, it, it was just great. And then I, I didn't know what I was going to do out here, and I went. My big, th- I've always been good at business, and then um, my 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 big, obviously big thing is boxing as well. So I went looking for a job in the gym, went for an interview, didn't get it, went to a different gym. Got a, got a job in this other gym, was there for like two months, mm-hmm. and I thought, I didn't like this, so I left, and a guy who was managing the boxing gym, Kevin Watson, he, uh, I said, let's let's go and do our own thing on the boot camp on the beach, so we went down there to the boot camp on the beach, and that was kind of that was kind of the start of boxing, really. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, when was your, so you done the boot camp, um, and then I, I guess you, you built a following, did, um, I mean, I'm guessing that combination of you being an ex-professional and being English as well, making yourself a little bit different, standing out a little bit, that must have helped when building your business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, an Olympian and having this pedigree yeah. really helped with that, with that because I, the, um, obviously in the boxing boxing fitness world, uh, I mean, who, who who would you know, everyone would want to learn from an Olympian, so yeah. that really helped and then, uh, my business partner's great at what he what he does, yeah. uh, and people loved him, and yeah, we just we just flourished, and and the business took off. And awesome, uh, mate. So your first gym that was because I know you've got two, but that's is Santa Monica. That was your, was that your first gym that you opened? Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, yeah so the Box and Burn Academy um, that you started up. How did you sort of come up with that, and how? How difficult was it to actually get that business going or did it really sort of take off early doors? And I'm sure you were putting in some big sort of 16-hour days in, in, in the early days, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm an energy and, um, and 
yeah, it it just uh, it just took off. We we never went into it to make money. We yeah. went into it because we loved it, and people knew that. And and it, we know we tried the custom as well. We built a really good community. Yeah. And, and and that's that's what it's about. That's what business is about. You know, if you if you give, if you can give a great service to your to your customers, they're gonna come back. They're gonna f- tell their friends about you. And we didn't know that at first. Like we just did what we did, and we just loved it. And yeah, and that's how we kind of that's how we kind of took off. And then, uh, yeah, we opened the first gym in 2012. Then in uh, the the classes and the gym was getting so so busy. Then. It was like let's open the next gym, so we opened our sec- second gym eighteen months later because we were getting so busy. And yeah. now we've got two gyms. And then in two thousand and fifteen, me and uh, another guy, Glenn Holmes, we decided we'll do a, a boxing burn academy or education program. And we did that, and and now that's took off as well. So we travel in the world teaching people how to teach boxing. That's awesome. That's really cool, and it's really nice yeah. to know it's come. That success has come from just a genuine and like passionate place. Like there's nothing fake about it. it. Is what it is. You guys are yourself and. You've made it through that. That must be a really good feeling. So, in terms of your box and burn yeah, academy, yeah. like the system and the uh, the program that that you use, what is about what is it like about your system that you think that people love and what what is so good about it that like the system that you guys have put together? Right. Yeah. Well, the, so the the education program uh, we teach people like the way that we the way that we teach people in the box and burn gyms. Yeah. It's, it's it's like two separate businesses. Uh, so the ed- with the education, people people love it because obviously it's successful, it's fun, and it's uh, and they know they're going to get better. So they invest in they invest in money and time into themselves, and they come away with it uh, like like really really happy because it gives them the confidence to go and teach boxing. It gives them the confidence and the system to go and teach boxing and charge for it. And earn money from it, uh, and, and you know, which I mean, everyone wants to do that at the end of the day. So if you're a fit, because right now boxing is the biggest trend in fitness. Like everyone wants to box for fitness. Yeah. But not everyone knows how to teach boxing. So you'll get personal trainers who try and teach boxing, and they don't really. Mm. They haven't sort of. Yeah. Doesn't. Yeah. So they come to us, and, and we're the best at it. So yeah. We'll, we'll, Awesome, mate. And you must be because, I mean, you go on the website and you see it's attracted so many big, like, Hollywood stars, like, big, like, actors. I think, was it Chris Hemsworth and tons of actors, like, and, yeah. and big sort of stars. How how surreal is that when people like that walk through your doors and you're taking people on the pads and you've just been watching them at the cinema, like, in The Avengers or something? That must be well, it's funny crazy. When Chris, when Chris Hemsworth come in, it was a few years ago. Yeah, I didn't have a clue who he was, and he came. <laughs> yeah, that's good though. I, I, shook, shook, yeah. I shook his hand and I said, "Hey, mate, how's it going?" And uh, he said, "Hello." I said, "Oh, are you from Australia? Uh, I compete in the Commonwealth Games, and we're talking about that." Yeah. And uh, he said, "He said, uh, do you think you can hold some some mitts for me?" I said, yeah. oh, "Mate, I'm about to go out and get me lunch. Uh, maybe <laughs> next time, he's my business card. So give me a business card." Uh, that's cool, like, that's really funny. Yeah, yeah. I walk outside and there's about fifty, well not fifty, about thirty paparazzi there with the cameras. I went, <laughs> what, what, what he's doing? Like, who he's taking pictures of? Yeah. Got Chris Hemsworth in there. I went, who's Chris Hemsworth? <laughs> Four. So oh yeah. We phone real quick. Yeah. I was like, oh shit. Oh, I thought, oh now I've blew it. I've told four <laughs> to get out of the gym and you had no idea. That's yeah, funny. so I went back in the sport room a bit, and then, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then, he, then, he te- then he texted me a couple of days later, he come back in, and we start working together. Yeah. Uh, great guy. That's so awesome, mate. That's really funny. I like that. That's cool. Because yeah. um, I know on your website as well, I also read that um, you're a UFC striking coach, and I know you've worked with and friends with uh, Brendan Sharp. So how did uh, this sort of UFC fighters, MMA fighters, uh, sort of more coming forward to... Um, you know, to get you to work with them because uh, striking in MMA is obviously, you know, it's taken a lot more seriously now that the level of striking has gone up a lot. So, and how do you find coaching boxing to like an MMA guy? Because like the stance is different. What are the sort of challenges yeah. when you're trying to teach an MMA fighter, you know, pure boxing? Well, yeah, well, uh, when, Brent, when Brendan came in, I didn't have a clue about MMA and, and, and all that. And and he uh, he wanted to just do straight up striking, so I taught him like I would teach a boxer. Then I started looking in the MMA and watching his next opponent and thinking the game plans and, and 
really trying to learn and educate myself on it. And then I work with the wrestling coach just so I get a better understanding of it. Yeah. So I wanted him to get the best he could out of me. And, um, yeah, and, and he's the only fighter I've worked with and I'll not work with any more MMA fighters uh, yeah. or any more fighters. But, yeah. Uh, I yeah, suppose you're just uh, too busy. You've, you're just flat out busy anyway. You've got so much going yeah, on. Yeah, I'm too busy to, to, to do that. And uh, Yeah. But yeah, and I, I learned a lot from it, so I didn't really know much about it. And then obviously, yeah, like you said, the, the boxing stance is different. Uh, mm. uh, the, the movement's different. There's a, there's a lot of things different with MMA than it is in boxing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then then I, I developed a great relationship with Brendan and become like really good friends with him. And now he's retired as well. Like like when I retired from boxing, I went done some successful stuff. Now he's absolutely killing it. Just yeah, he's killing it. He's doing co- yeah, he's doing comedy and he's like uh, his podcasts are really good. Like King and the Sting and Fighter and the Kid. He's yeah, he's he's done so well. He's he's a great example of an athlete who's retired and just pushed forward like you have as well. Yeah, I don't think there's any any more other. Like boxers or MMA fighters ever that have done as well as him after, or maybe George Foreman has with that, with, that, uh, <laughs> with the, grill. the grill, yeah. Or he's done well with the grill, <laughs> uh, yeah. He can put his feet up now, he's earned enough money off of that, right? But yeah, it's, it's just the star for Brendan, and I think Brendan will over, overtake George Foreman and the amount of money that he's made from that grill. I think Brendan will eventually uh, overtake that because he's doing really well, and yeah. his work ethic's unbelievable, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, uh, so it was great work with Brendan and great to be a uh, great to be a uh, good friends with him still. Yeah, cool, mate. Um, so future plans uh, for the Box and Burn Academy. What are you thinking, sort of long term? Are you got any stuff in the pipeline, or what? What's your sort of plans for the future? Are you just happy where you are at the moment and just you're super uh, busy? Right now, we're talking to investors who want to invest in the gym and uh, do uh, do something big, uh, which I'm not quite sure what that might be right now there's a few options where it could be licensed somewhere if you're yeah. a gym in uh, Sheffield England who doesn't have boxing but you want to put a boxing fitness class in your gym we can come and train all your trainers and you can do a boxing burn class in there we can give you all of the everything that you need and we can get that around like nearly well just about as many gyms as we can really yeah. so we can get thousands of gyms around the world but that's one idea then um uh, then franchising the gym out is another idea. So there's a there's a few uh, going around now, but we're just talking to investors right now to see uh, exactly what we can do. Yeah, awesome, mate. Sounds good. Good luck with it. Well, you've you know nice what you've created is absolutely incredible um, so far. So fair play to you, mate. Just keep yeah keep doing what you're doing. Um, cool, mate. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna wrap it up. But with um, with my podcast, I always finish with like these three areas of like inspiration. Um, um and that the that the listeners can sort of learn from a little bit so i have um uh, a book that you'd recommend that you've that you've read that you like a film that you've watched that you recommend and a person that's inspired you um at some point in your life so is there a particular book that you're reading or one that you've read that you'd recommend others to sort of check out and that could be anything at all now. yeah i'm reading a book now called uh, virtual freedom it's talking about hiring uh, virtual assistants I've, I've currently got four virtual assistants working for me, uh, two from the Philippines, one from Africa, and yeah. one from India. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm getting right into that now. And they're currently working like over 100 hours a week for me right now, and uh, I'm paying them, it's like $400 a week for that, like total, for all of them, $100, uh, 100 hours a week, because the you know you pay them like, three dollars an hour so it's really really good and i'm learning more about managing that and 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 how that's like different ways to use them to help me grow my business i've just thought i'd do that so that's called virtual freedom yeah um, that sounds really cool that's something i've not heard of that i'm sure people would benefit from looking into that like someone like someone like you i'm guessing you edit your own podcast is you can get someone to do that work for you see if you're doing see if you're doing five hours editing or whatever and uploading and yeah, create yeah. graphics for this podcast mm-hmm. to post where you can get one of that get get someone to do it yeah. for you know for three dollars an hour sounds uh, great so mate. that's the book and yeah what was the uh, uh, a the film first? so it could be a favorite film or free a film that inspired you at some point or it could be a documentary but yeah something you've watched yeah uh, it's a tough one <laughs> uh, yeah i don't I, I don't really watch tv for inspiration unless it's unless it's youtube 
Yeah. You know, um, I'll, I'll watch videos on YouTube by a guy called Neil Patel. Uh-huh. He's he's a, he talks about SEO, growing your business, and uh, and and that sort of stuff. So Neil Patel, Neil Neil Patel yeah. is great for for that stuff. Yeah. Uh, cool. I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm inspired, but he definitely educates me, and yeah. that's what I'm about now. Awesome. And, then, uh, and a, person a person as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm 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 a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, uh-huh. He's been on my podcast. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, he's uh, do you know who he is? No, tell me about him a little bit. Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. Okay. He's a uh, he's he's one of, for me one of the most inspiring people on the internet. Now he he talks a lot of truth and he's great for growing your business. He's he he, he tells you basically what you should do to to grow your business and and and. Uh, to, to perform better and all that and yeah I think he's really good and I, I love to learn off him not just what he says but what he does I'll, I'll see what he does and I try and do that and he's someone else who's great for my business Cool, so if anyone's listening who's starting up a business or thinking about it he would be a good go-to person to check out Yeah, Gary Vaynerchuk okay. definitely. I'm surprised you haven't heard of him mate Yeah, you I'll definitely definitely, yeah, I'll check him out on your podcast Well, um, yeah. that, that's it Tony Thanks man, I really appreciate you coming on bud because I know you're super super busy so Thanks yeah, for your time and, and good luck with everything in the future that you're doing. Thanks for having me. You're Cheers. welcome. Cool, guys. Hope you enjoyed that episode, and I'll catch you guys soon. Peace.